Morning, Cornerstone. Today we'll be looking at the eighth psalm. I'll open with prayer. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come before you today and to open your word. We thank you, Lord, that we have your word, and your word gives us everything we need for life and godliness. I pray that you would give us ears to hear as your people, Lord. I pray that you would visit us today and encourage our faith and allow us to see you more clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. Make a name, build a dynasty, leave a legacy. These are the words of the heart of man. Notice me, praise me, remember me. This is the song of the sinner, the cursed dream. My question this morning for each of us to wrestle with as we look at the eighth psalm is this. Whose glory are we living for? What is your life directed toward? Is it directed towards the glory of your great name, or is it directed towards the glory of the only worthy king? Psalm 8. How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I want to start by pointing out to you the structure of this psalm. We begin with a statement of hope about the Lord, our Lord, whose glory does fill the whole earth. The psalm continues on to express the majesty and power of God, but then around verse 4 and onward, it shifts the attention to man, man's role in creation, and how we've been given a dignified position in that created order. But the psalm doesn't end focusing on the crown placed on our heads. It ends with him. It ends giving all the glory to him. Lord, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. There's a daily temptation for mankind to make everything about themselves. At least for me, there is. Daily temptation. But this chapter, this short song, combats this with great force. In this chapter, there's a real contemplation over the person of God and the person of man. John Calvin once said, Wisdom consists in two things, knowledge of God and knowledge of self. And I think that's quite applicable to today's passage. This chapter is all about God's glory in creation, and yet it has so much to say about man's role in that creation. Another way pulled right out of scripture to shine light on the word this morning is this. The beginning of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To understand who we are and to understand who God is, to be humbled at understanding the vast expanse between us, to be all inspired at the thought of the eternal self-existent God is the beginning of true self-awareness. However, it's not only important to understand how much higher God is than us, but to understand that he has seen us and given us such privilege. He has crowned us with glory and honor so that we may steward the creation for his glory. So we're going to begin uh, by looking at verses 1 and 2 and seeing how God chooses the weak of this world for his purposes. Second, we're going to look at man's intended role in the creation through, uh, in verses 3 through 8. And then third and briefly, we're going to look at how Christ is actually the center of this psalm. In verse 1, you may have noticed and I accidentally skipped over this. It starts with, O Lord, our Lord. That's important. 
The first Lord is spelled with all caps, and probably most of us here know what that means. That's, that's in reference to when Moses was at the burning bush and he's told, go to Pharaoh and tell him, I am has sent you. And so David starts the psalm by saying, O oh Lord, O oh, oh great I am, O oh creator, O oh self-existent one. And he follows it up by saying, our Lord. He's saying, O oh Lord, God of all creation, you are my Lord. The second time Lord is used, it's not the same word, it's Adonai, which means ras- master, ruler, king. There's a personal aspect to what's going on here. He's saying, O God of heaven and earth, O God of all things, you're my king. I think this is amazing because it's important to see God as God overall. He reigns over the whole world, but in a particular sense, when we read this psalm, we have to understand that he was God over Israel in particular. He drew near to them, and so likewise, we now as the people of God, when we call in the name of the Lord, our Adonai, He is the God of all creation, but he is the God who knows us personally. He is Lord over our lives individually. David, in the previous seven Psalms, has been crying out to the Lord for help as there are those who have been pursuing his life. And so he finds comfort in being reminded that God, the God over all, is his king, is his defender. Do you know this morning that the God over all creation knows you? Do you take comfort knowing that although your life be full of trials, your king is God over all? David continues in verse 1 saying, How majestic is your name in all the earth. So he started by calling on the great I am, the the all caps Lord, the, the, uh, the name that Moses was revealed, which is a recognition of God's unique glory. And then he follows that up by saying, you, Lord, are my Adonai. You're my king, my Lord. And he follows that up by saying, your glory fills the earth. You're Lord over all. You're my Lord. You're Lord over all. There's a pattern. Verse 1 concludes by saying, you have set your glory above the heavens. So not only is God the God of all the earth, every nation, every tongue, every tribe, but also the heavens and the heavenly beings in all of creation. And it's interesting to me that it says this, his glory is set above the heavens. In the heavens, there are celestial bodies more glorious than we really can fathom. The, the, the stars, the moons, the millions of galaxies. There's, there's actually videos online. There's suns way bigger than what we can imagine. We're so small. I think though that, that in reading this chapter, we shouldn't only think of the physical space out there But in scripture, oftentimes, when stars are spoken of, there's reference to angels. And I think there's a point there in this chapter. This psalm stresses how God is above the created order. He is wholly set apart. He's different than all of creation. He's grander than the greatest things of creation. But this doesn't mean that the creation isn't also glorious. It is. The creation in various aspects reflects the glory of God. That's what it was intended to do. But the creation is not and never will be God. When the writer speaks of God's glory being set above the heavens, I can't help but think of the beings in the heavens, the heavenly beings, and more specifically of Lucifer, that great angel whom Ezekiel writes about saying, your heart was proud because of your beauty, You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Isaiah writes about him saying, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Day star, son of dawn, corrupted because of beauty and splendor. This is the description offered concerning Lucifer in the Bible. So clearly God didn't make his creation ugly in order that he might be exalted above. He made the creation, the whole creation, the angels, as reflections of his glory. So that in all things he might be glorified, that the, that the earth might be full of his majesty. 
The problem, however, is that it was that gift of splendor that God gave to Lucifer that was the cause of his fall. Instead of seeing the majesty of God's handiwork and giving glory to him, Lucifer was seduced by his own glorification, his own thought of being something. Instead of worshiping the God whom all glory comes from, he began to worship himself. Bless you. He mimics the eighth psalm in Isaiah when he says, I will ascend to heaven above the stars. I will ascend above the clouds. In other words, he's saying, I will set my glory above the heavens. I will make myself like God. And so what we have to see from this is that God has made things in creation with an inherent dignity and honor, that there is beauty all over his creation, but that that beauty is intended for one purpose, and that's to point back to him. This was actually the thought that brought me to, the, to this passage for today's message. The Lord, has he not showered us with so many blessings beyond what we even give thanks for? How many do we miss? Is there not so much beauty in our lives, I mean, with the friends he gives us and the opportunities for growth and the precious memories throughout the years as we look back? All these intended to be enjoyed by God's beloved children, but never intended to be worshipped always meant to point us back to him, that with all the affections in our hearts for the created things, we would turn to the creator and pour out our praise to him. That's the point of all of creation. Just recently at RVR, I was in a conversation with a brother about the God-centeredness of God. What I mean by this is that God does everything for his own glory. Amen. <laughs> And oftentimes when we talk about this, it can bother us because, well, frankly, we think we should be at the center of everything. And we think, isn't that a little selfish of the Lord? He does everything for his own glory. But I want to point out that when God is the center of everything, when he is the name that is being lifted up, everything flourishes because everything was made for that. Anytime in our lives that we are tripped up by pride, thinking that we have attained to something, shifting our focus from him to us, we learn fairly quickly that if we're the center, everything around us begins to shrivel and die. If I'm living for my own glory, then all of my relationships suffer decay. I'll try to put this another way. I think it's amazing the thought that God worships God. He magnifies and exalts and loves himself. And if he were not to be focused on his own glory, it would be idolatry in the heart of God because he is the only one worthy of all things. We want so badly in our day with church services designed for delicate sensitivities and preferences, just the right setting for things to be about us, for him to be about us. But he's not. Even our salvation is about him. We are saved because the father wanted a bride for his son. We are byproducts of a divine love relationship. As I was writing this, I thought of the song that said, and I forget what it's called, but why should I gain from his reward? We sing it a lot. The thought behind this is that we who are saved, we who have been shown the love of God, have found ourselves so fortunate because of a divine drama. The reason why you and I are saved is because Jesus won the battle and gained a reward for his victory. It's really all God-centered. What this says about our identity is that salvation is not based on us, on our consistency, on our faithfulness. It is based on Jesus receiving the reward that he rightfully earned. We can't be lost because he earned us and his reward will not be taken away. What joy can be found when God is at the center of salvation? Lucifer, so exalted, so esteemed in the creation, came to nothing because he thought he was the center. He thought there was some glory original to him. This is where I think verse 2 is so well placed. It says, out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength to still the enemy and the avenger. Some English translations bring over the word praise instead of strength. And I think this is amazing that God makes glorious things like the heavenly beings but he doesn't care for their lip service if their hearts are far from him. He is able to establish praise from the mouth of babes, from those who have nothing to offer God, only confusion and need 
and weakness, they are the ones that God wants. This is why Jesus said, you must become as a little child in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He says, don't bring to me your splendor and proclaim your might and show me your heart set on yourself. Come to me in weakness. Come to me in humility. Come to me in your folly and I will make you wise. I think of the time that Jesus came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday riding on a donkey. I was thinking about that word donkey because I talk like, I might be saying it wrong right now. I'm a Pennsylvania Dutch and I say donkey and I always get made fun of by my friends. So I was really intentional about that. Um, Matthew 21, 14 through 16, Palm Sunday. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and they said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. Here we see the wise men, the established ones, the studied, the respectable, hating Jesus missing their opportunity to praise God, and we find children praising his name, shouting, Hosanna, deliver us, O King. And so the core of my first point is this. God doesn't need the learned, the majestic, the powerful. He looks for the humble. He doesn't need Lucifer, and he doesn't need the smartest of men. He has prepared praise out of the mouth of babies and infants. This morning, are we a people who are focused on ourselves, on our own strength and success, or are we a people of aware of our need, of our weakness, of our dependence upon God? So let us be like the little children. It's so easy in life to begin to compare ourselves with what is around us, to say, even of our brothers and sisters, I'm better at that, I'm smarter, I'm stronger. A couple years ago, I went to Sight and Sound, the theater in Lancaster, to see the play David. The show stressed how David was a nothing, nobody in his shepherding days, just a dirty little boy. Um, but he knew the Lord's presence. When he became the great king of Israel, they pointed out, they stressed this, he'd become full with the praises of man, and he no longer sought the presence of God as he did when he was a kid. The line that really stuck with me was David asking himself, would I rather have the praise of man or the presence of God? It can be so easy throughout the day to become caught in ego, and I do this every day of my life, thinking that our value and satisfaction comes from winning competition, but upon meditating on God, this all seems so insignificant. What does it matter if I'm better than anyone else when I look at God? Daily, I feel the Lord offering the opportunity to look to him and to forget about the rat race of sizing up against other people. How much time, how much insecurity have I stroked? How much energy have I invested in focusing on man when one look at God brings humility and freedom? Verses 3 and 4 says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man, that you care for him. In other words, David is meditating, saying, Lord, you made the heavens with your fingers. All of creation can be set under a microscope to you. Everything is like a speck of dust in comparison to you, and yet you see us. What is man that you are mindful of us? This posture is one of gratitude and humility. It's like David is blushing at the thought, God sees me. He sees us. What have we done that God cares for us? And so this question, what is man, is what I will try to answer for our second point. It's not that we have done anything. When in verse 5 and 6 he speaks of man being crowned with glory and honor and being given dominion over God's creation, there's a recalling of the narrative in Genesis when God made man and woman. It's not that we have done anything to receive the attention of God or the privileges that come with being a human. 
It is simply that God made us in his, Im in his image in order that we may be his representatives on the earth. From the very start before man ever spoke a word, he was given dignity, a place of honor in creation. God designed us to be as instruments of authority on the earth that all the animals and all the created order may be subject to us for his glory. It's not that man has splendor and majesty to offer God as if he needed something from us. It's simply that God made us with the honor of being his appointed head over creation. What's astounding in the next part is that in every way possible, man was like God in the beginning. Man was crowned with glory and honor. Man was given dominion. Man was put above all things, but man was still made for God's glory and not his own. Man was made to be the first in line of God's servants. But as Lucifer did in heaven, so also he did on earth. In Genesis 3, 5, the serpent says to Adam, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The temptation that was offered to Adam was to be like God, to come out from under his oppressive authority and set himself above the creation you see, it's the same thing. Lucifer was given such privilege, such honor, such glory and splendor, and he just wanted one more thing. I just want to be like God. And that's the temptation that Lucifer brought to Adam, saying, look, you've been given everything, but you just lack this one thing. And God doesn't want you to have it. The struggle was to just be free from the authority of God. Instead of saying, how majestic is your name, O Lord, in all the earth, Adam sung the song of the serpent, saying, may my name be majestic in all the earth. And so the rest is history. Man did, in some sense, break free. Man found deliverance from the chains of Eden and rested in the freedoms of death. Man's head was stripped of glory and honor and replaced with shame Instead of dominion over the beasts of the field, man found fear at their sight. Instead of fruitful subduing of the earth, thickets and thorns grew in multitude. Instead of a world at peace under the authority of God's appointed head, now there is disruption, sickness, natural disasters, famine, and so on, brokenness all over. Instead of man ruling on behalf of God, Satan has become the god of this world. But this is not the end. Genesis 3.15 declares that there would be a baby coming one day to restore the kingdom of God, a child who would crush the head of the serpent. He would be one who would sing the psalm of David to its end, one who would rejoice that the earth is all for God, one who would come and fulfill his role as the representative God wanted, and one who would finish by giving all the glory back to God. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? I repeat this verse again because what I notice is that it doesn't say, what are the angels that you're mindful of them? It was both angels and men who rebelled against God, both in the same way. It was pride. It was an attempt to escape God's rule, but this psalm is not ruined because of our sin. If it were written of the angels, they would have needed to receive redemption lest the psalm fail, but the psalm doesn't fail because though Adam forfeited his place, God has sent a redeemer for Adam's race. Hebrews 2 says, It was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, but man. And now at this time, we don't see everything subjected to man because of the power of sin and death. But the writer points to the true man, Jesus, the second, the better Adam, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, in order that through death he may gain victory over Satan, who has the power of death. Jesus took the crown of shame and dishonor from the head of Adam's race and wore it when they placed the thorn on his head. Jesus took the brokenness, the disorder of the creation upon himself, so that he may be the head of a new race. Through suffering, Jesus reversed the curse of Adam and now has become God's appointed man to rule the creation. He has fulfilled the call that was given to man in the beginning. He has been highly exalted above all powers and above all things. And it is to his name, to the, to the name of Jesus, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess on the last day to the glory of the Father. 
It is to his glory that you and I, his church, have been washed clean of sin and daily are sanctified. What news is this? Who are we, the people of God, that he has so noticed us? Why has he blessed us this way? It is amazing all the wonderful things in life he gives for us to enjoy, but above all, we are a people whose names are written in the book of life, a people who have salvation. How have we landed so prosperously? Who are we that he cares for us? I see this chapter as, as deeply humbling and yet deeply exalting to man. We are nothing, and yet God has so loved us even before we were born. I want to end with a closing thought about Christ, his ministry. Remember that the eighth psalm begins by proclaiming the majesty of God in verse 1. And in the last verse, it ends the same way, the same words, with proclaiming the majesty of God. Somewhere in the middle where man is given glory and honor is where Adam got off track. He didn't finish the psalm. He didn't make it to the end. He got lost in his own royal privileges. But Christ, the true and better Adam, the man from heaven, was able to conclude his service to the Father by giving all the glory back to him. After accomplishing what he came to do, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28 says this. Then comes the end when he, Christ, delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son will also be subjected to God, who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. So Christ has done what Adam was called to do in the beginning. Mankind was always intended to be God's instrument for rule on the earth, but never for our glory. This is why Christ in the end delivers the kingdom back to God the Father, that all things may be for him, that his majesty may fill the earth. Christ, having earned a name that is worthy of all praise and adoration, leads us by himself being satisfied in his Father, that even the Son of God grasps on to nothing, but yields all to the Father, that he may be all in all. So I'll conclude today with the same question I began with. What is your life directed toward? The glory of your great name or the glory of the only worthy king? Will you strive throughout life in order to obtain satisfaction in your own strength or will you entrust yourself to the loving hand of your father? Are you happy to be his servant who receives his gifts according to his good will for your life or will you set yourself above him in your life? Will you covet trying to be your own Adonai? Or will you entrust yourself to the God who gives abundantly to his children? If he has not spared even his own son, will he not graciously give us all things? And last, will you be one to leave a legacy of glory for yourself? Or will you say with the sweet singer of Israel, verse 9, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this humbled, exalted position that you have given us in creation. We thank you, Lord, that though we come before you as nothing, you have made something of us. We come before you as offering nothing that you need from us, but you've delighted to bless us as your people. And Lord, even more so than what David saw in the psalm, we who have come after Christ, we are confident in our, in our salvation, Lord. We have been so blessed and we've deserved nothing. And I pray, Lord, that you would be the center of it all. I pray that you would be our God, our Lord, from day to day, that you, you would get all the glory for our lives and that we'd be happy in you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.